This video is brought to you by Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. Find out more about this month's hella good snacks at the end of the video. You don't want to miss it, trust me. Hey guys, what is up? It is me, Rasmo, and I've been dragged back into the world of My Little Pony because you guys wanted me to watch Rainbow Rocks after my first initial review of the first Equestria movie. You said the songs were better, the story were better, the characters have more time to shine, and that I shouldn't hope for the flashlight shift between Flash and Twilight. So let's get started because I am ready to talk about some My Little Pony stuff today. My Little Pony Equestria Girls is a prequel story to the series Friendship is Magic. It's set between season 3 and 4, and I only know this thanks to Caster Blocks' comment in the MLP forums, give credit to where credit is due. Then we get a follow-up movie called Rainbow Rocks that shows the aftermath of the incident in the first Equestria movie, after Twilight Sparkle has left the human world and went back to her own. This might surprise you guys, but I am not a My Little Pony fan, and I was only asked to watch this Equestria series by my patron Mindhack, which, by the looks of his request, might make me watch all of the Equestria movies, I don't know. I'm not complaining though. It's their reward on the Patreon tier, so I'll gladly indulge while crying. Now, if you haven't watched the movie or forgotten what happened, let me give you a brief synopsis. The story continues after the events of the first movie where Twilight gets back her crown, having the old antagonist Sunset Shimmer be a part of the main crew, sort of, in this film, trying to understand more about friendship and being a better person after her incident which they summarize nicely as a demon. I turned into a raging she-demon. And tried to turn everyone here into teenage zombies for your personal army! Then the three new antagonists of the series join the school to find equestrian magic to feed off of so that they can get their power back. And that's when they drag in Twilight back using Sunset's magic book. The students and the teachers get hypnotized by the sirens, making them all feel realistically suited in a teen high school drama setting, if I'm being honest. Just everyone mean and insecure, scared. Twilight then returns and was tasked to make a spell for the people of Canterlot High. But for them to do that, they have to join the Battle of the Bands. Basically, that's the whole premise of the movie's back burner, while the the story tries to juggle many character arcs starting with Twilight's pressure to meet people's expectations of her, and Sunset being a foil to that and trying to go against what people expect of her and that is to mess up and ruin things for everyone. And by the look of everyone's reaction to the mere mention of the fall formal ball, where Sunset was the villain and did all of the crazy doohickey, it seems like it's still recent and fresh on everybody's minds. I think it's going to be one of the most exciting events we've had at CHS since the fall formal. <laughs> It was a great start to see Sunset actually making an effort to change for the better and show everyone that she's willing to put in the extra step to make that change even happen. Even if everyone keeps referencing and mentioning the incident that she so desperately wants to forget to the point that it became a running gag throughout the movie. The thing she needs is another CHS event almost ruined by some power crazed lunatic. Uh, no offense. <sighs> None taken. It's not like we haven't tangled with dark magic before and totally whooped it sorry but... Uh, no offense. <sighs> None taken. Again. This happens two more times in the movie, so you get the picture. The villains of this movie are the three silents named Adagio Dazzle, Aria Blaze, and Sonata Dusk, obviously having musical names related to them. Adagio being a musical direction to play at a slower tempo in a certain part of a piece of music. Aria is a solo voice accompanied by an orchestra, mainly an opera, and Sonata, which basically just means a piece of music, as they are sirens and use their singing to feed off of negative energy. Their vibe and energy gives off mean girls with the power dynamics, and they remind me of the tricks from Winx Club. I like how they Karen, the less intelligent one amongst the mean girls for lack of better term for the cliche, is named simply Sonata, while the others have more musically niche or in-depth meaning behind it, while hers is basically just song. It's a song. What you see is what you get, I guess. The premise of having a battle of the bands was their way to shove in as many songs as they can. That was my initial thought, but between Equestria Girls and Rainbow Rocks, they have, if I'm not mistaken, almost the same number of insert songs. But the only difference is the genres vary now. The first movie only had upbeat pop songs that mend well with the main six's vibe and message of friendship, but now we have the Dazzlings with a more dark, slow kind of music. While Twilight and the gang have a full band and a pop upbeat melody with each song they sing, having the antagonist sing this time represents us with the opposite vibe of the main six, having EDM represent the Dazzlings, giving a darker tone with the drums and the bass as the main focus, and slowing things down as if it's pulling you in and keeping you listening. Just like what the sirens do, literally. When you guys said that the songs are better in Rainbow Rocks, to me, 
I don't don't get mad, okay? This is what I think. But I like the first movie's songs better since hearing it for the first time already made me get hooked whether I liked it or not because it was really catchy by the get-go. But with the songs in Rainbow Rocks, I feel like a lot of people like the songs better there because of the new kinds of tunes we get to hear. We're so used to hearing the upbeat, cheery music from Twilight and the gang that hearing a darker, more slick sounding songs was a breath of fresh air. It went from something like this. to giving us a taste of this kind of tune. Like it's a different genre and vibe altogether, so I understand that people would love this new sound you'd hear from the My Little Pony film. I'm not saying the songs here are bad, they're really good, but I needed to listen to it a few times before absolutely getting that earworm. My favorite being, and I'm sure this is a common opinion, is Under Our Spell, the Dazzling's main song. And while we're on the topic of songs, I just gotta say, Trixie's band, this girl right here, they let us hear a fraction of their song, and this is what it sounds like. See me dominate, cause I'm powerful and great, yeah, yeah. Which, come on. As soon as I heard that, even just for a moment, I was hooked. But it was over before Trixie could even shine. Let this woman cook. And of course, I'm not going to ignore the final song. I'm sure a lot of fans loved it because of the mashup of vibes and the back and forth of the two bands. A fun thing I noticed is that the songs that the main six usually sing are in D major or a major key, while the dazzling songs are in a minor key. Under Our Spell is C sharp minor, and the fact that their song Welcome to the Show, where they exchange verses, are sung in B minor. And this is just my personal opinion, but I think this shows that even in the sirens level and out of the main six's comfort zone, they still manage to sound upbeat and give the same vibe they always do in their songs. That's a bit of a stretch, but I'm not sure if it's intentional, but I'd like to think it was. Getting all that out of what I wanted to say about the music, let's talk about the plot and the story. The plot of the movie is simple. Musical bad guys pop up and brainwash everybody, and since their magic only comes out through music, they fight in a battle of the bands to break everybody from the siren spell. I'm not gonna lie, this school always gets brainwashed. I'm kind of worried. If I had a kid, I will not bring them to Counterlock High. It's a good premise, and also the fact that they didn't forget where they left off Sunset Shimmer, with the gang to help teach her how to be a better version of herself, albeit a bit sudden, but I'll assume enough time has passed to justify her quick switch in personality and motivations. Along with Sunset's progress to be more confident in herself to be able to change and help people, they also introduced a character struggle for Twilight, where she worries about not meeting people's expectations. They were an obvious foil for each other, and it was clearly spelled out to us in the scene where they both wake up in the middle of the night worrying about it doesn't mean it's guaranteed to happen. But that doesn't stop them from expecting it. Which only makes things harder because the last thing you want to do is... Let, let everybody, everybody down. down. This scene right here already sets up well how these two are much more in common and would definitely be perfect to help each other. Hell, they even established Twilight to be her support in the first movie by being the one to reach out to her and give her a second chance. It would have been great to see Sunset be the one to support her this time, especially since they had a talk about it and Twilight expressing her concerns about the pressures put onto her. And I don't think it's far from her personality either to notice these little things because Sunset was the one to notice minor details that helped the rain booms the whole time. But the scene ends with Sunset vocalizing her trust in Twilight to make the spell, which was something that added to Twilight's worries. But it did hammer in the fact that everyone is relying on her, and she hesitates to reach out for help. I would have loved to see more interactions with Twilight and Sunset, even if it's just small conversations or scenes that don't mean much but carry a lot of weight when you look at it in each of the characters' arcs. Since they both have a lot in common besides being Celestia's student, knowing things about magic, and having concerns about how people perceive them, they did manage to wrap up the same idea and concept by the end, granted a little rushed and late but with everything going on with this movie having only an hour and 30 minute runtime, I get why it wasn't focused on more. I wish they made the character beats and progressions more clear, taking their time with it, but I'll take what I can get. It's still okay for me in terms of characters. And Sunset was able to help Twilight in her own way at the end. Before we move on from Sunset though, I kinda wish we got more of the spunky Sunset from the first movie, where she fights back and gives the vibe of someone not to be messed with, especially since the sirens are making trouble for her and her friends. I really thought we would get that moment when she confronted the sirens in the same place she confronted Twilight in the first movie. You're never gonna get away with this. Why? Because you didn't? 
And I could look at it in two ways. Firstly, it could show how Sunset has changed from being the mean girl that lurks in the dark hallways and scares you in secret, but now she's getting a taste of her own medicine. And on the other hand, I see this as them missing the chance to showcase one of Sunset's traits that make her stand out the most, the tough girl that you do not want to cross. And yet here she gets immediately sulky and insecure, which I'm not gonna say it's a bad thing because in context of the film, it definitely makes sense. From where Sunset is at this point in time, she lacks the confidence and support to be someone people can trust and rely on. So when the sirens hit the mark, it makes her back away instantly. Still though, I would have loved to see the headstrong Sunset sass the sirens back, even if it's just a facade, to show that she's not backing down from them. And then she goes sulky after they left, you know? Oh well. I did remember some comments telling me not to get my hopes up about seeing Flash and Twilight together here, and I definitely didn't. But it was cute to see him at the start just asking for Twilight, like this guy, this guy fell hard. And all the risks from the first movie, like Twilight, left off elsewhere. I'm not sad or disappointed that they didn't do anything with the ship because I do like the internal struggle of Twilight and Sunset's characters more. And I can totally understand that having Flash unnaturally shoved in this film just for a cute romantic moment won't mend well with the plot and theme that they were trying to get, though they did do that a little bit. That ugh. See, Flash's purpose in the first movie, at least in my eyes, was a dangling carrot to make Twilight and the audience think, well, everything is going horribly for Twilight, but at least there's a cute dude that she likes. Like, aside from the main gang that she is fairly acquainted with from the get-go, introducing a new character that makes the main character nervous and be a bubbling idiot is always a fun watch. And also, he sometimes acts like a plot device for funny misunderstanding scenarios, but in Rainbow Rocks, we don't really need any misunderstanding cliches or romantic drama because they want to focus on the sirens and the main six or seven, including Sunset now. Though I did feel sad to see him act so aggressive because of the spell, like, like, whoa, tiny child, calm down. But yeah, as someone who was dragged to watch this film, I say that I really did like it. Did I think it was a step up from the first movie? Not really. I think it's the same in terms of quality for me. But the story in the first was a lot more linear and focused than this one. But the songs in Rainbow Rocks are diverse and I love the Trixie song so much. Thanks, Mindhack, for requesting this movie. My next movie review will be about Night on the Galactic Railroad as requested by my patron, Cross. If you want to watch me review a specific movie, why not consider being a patron so that you can force me to watch a movie of your choice? And I can't say no to it. You know, Sunset Shimmer getting roasted by the Dazzlings remind me of The Heat, which is the theme of today's sponsor featuring my dogs because they won't leave me alone while I was filming this. Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are bringing a taste of Japan this July with Tokyo Treat's Okinawa Seaside Snacking and Sakurako's Heritage of Nikko. Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are subscription boxes that deliver exclusive Japanese treats to your doorstep. Want modern pop goodies? I'm throwing Tokyo Treats your way! Want authentic Japanese delicacies? Boom! Sakurako's gotcha, baby! They got all you need from fun facts, lists of the goodies inside each box, and the list of ingredients and allergens so you know what you'll be eating. I picked up the Koikea salted caramel chips from Tokyo Treat that was more sweet than salty, and I felt like I was eating popcorn, except without the annoying hard kernels getting stuck between my teeth. I also ate the Nori Shio Dragon Twist because it's just chips but saltier, and I like the shape. Look at it. It's so weird. Then I started munching on Sakurako's goodies, where they collaborated with Nikos local government to give you all these bad boys, to give you a taste of their rich heritage and culture. I like the Waka Ayu marshmallow that I thought had filling, but it didn't. It was just regular marshmallows, but fish-shaped, so I kind of like it. I'm simple that way. And of course, I wouldn't miss the Sesame Anko Donuts that is said to have, and I quote, tried and true recipe for over half a century. That rhymes. It's filled with red bean and I like it. If I had to tell you what it tastes like, it kind of tastes like Little Orbit, but without the massive oily coating. It says enjoy with milk, so don't forget the milk. Tell your dad to come back. Psst, come here, come here. See, see this? That's for you, my friend. Use this promo code and you can get $5 off of your first purchase from Tokyo Treat or Sakura Co. Box. Shh. Don't snitch, okay? Links are in the description if you decide to get one, which you should. Thanks again, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako, for sponsoring this video. So yeah, thanks a bunch to my patrons for keeping the channel alive. Special shout out to Cross, Christian V, Mindhack, and Jacob K in the Butternut tier. And the unique position for Effing Knight for staying strong in the Dill Pickles tier. Also, a new end card. I wanted to showcase your fan art, so look at all of them. Adorable. If you want to send your fan arts, you can tag me on my Twitter or Instagram so I can include them in my videos. No traced art, please. Thank you.